All right. Real happy to have my next guest on the Sports Card Shop at MoCo Guest Line. He's not new to the show, and I'm happy and proud to call him uh, a friend, and uh, that's none other than Dr. James Beckett. Welcome, Dr. Jim. Great to be here, John. Always a pleasure. So, you know, this I'm guilty of this myself. You're guilty of it, and it's, it's a good kind of guilty, right? We're almost in the single digits uh, away from the Nationals, so a lot of heavy national content leading up to what I call the Super Bowl and the hobby. It's the week everyone circles on their calendar uh, every year and, and looks forward to an anticipation. And for as long as I've been in the hobby, uh, you know, people th sometimes think I've been to a lot of nationals. My first one was actually 2018. So I know it more in what the, the current form we know it uh, now. The first one, obviously, uh, 1980 in, in Los Angeles at the Marriott airport and obviously a lot different than the the current uh, national uh, the form we know it and so i i never hear a lot of show because not many shows can probably talk about a retrospective of the national because they they can't touch on it because they don't have any experience and uh you're the one guy who uh you know as i've, I've said before uh you've attended every single one have not missed one so who better to talk about some of those early days of the national than someone that's never ever missed one and, and knows uh you know all of them in, in some uh form or fashion so i wanted to sort of look back and as a re i'm calling this a retrospective of the national so you know starting with that that first one dr jim 1980 uh los angeles like where did it come from what were the early thoughts uh, of of the hobby at that time of something like this, you know, what uh, what can you fill us in on from 1980? Well, first of all, you mentioned feeling guilty, and the only guilt I feel is <laughs> guilty that I feel so happy when I go to the National and I have so much fun, and you're at least bringing your, your wife this time to, to – yeah. you know, vacay alongside but and i and i did that some of the times over the years but you know it's just it's just a great getaway and uh it, it's it's gotten better over the years in the beginning like you say 1980 was more the the perception it was intending to be a national but it still felt like a really big regional show even though there were national dealers there uh it didn't look different you know it looked like a real big show real successful show. When you walked around, you see, wow, these guys are from the East Coast. These guys are from the Midwest. So it wasn't like a Los Angeles show. But you could, uh, I remember you could, you walked in. It seems like there was kind of like a, you walked in and then there was like a step down to the, to the show floor. But it wasn't that big. I mean, it was thousands of square feet, but not hundreds of thousands of square feet. And so you could see the the rows of tables. There wasn't a, a lot of action up in the air. It, they, they were mainly six foot tables that were even not even a lot of showcases, you know. And and when people yeah. left their table, they put a sheet on it. They, they didn't they didn't zip it up. And so it was very old fashioned, very old school, and very trusting. Uh, but that's that's the way it was. And it's and frankly, John, it stayed that way for ten years. Yeah. How many year. tables approximately would you say uh, this, the early, at least the first one? Supposedly it was 160 that, that, that first year. And then I think yeah. it got up into 200, 250, maybe 300. And then, like I said, as you got closer to 91, the 91 uh, Anaheim National was a turning point because that was way bigger, way bigger crowd, a lot more corporate support. And it, it was just, a completely different animal. And that maybe has been the most successful one ever. Although Chicago last year was, was, was pretty yeah. close. And this year I'm hoping that this year is going to be uh, really outstanding getting back to the East coast as well. Yeah. That first show just kind of, you know, you know, you always, when, when something's big, you always kind of, and you never been to the first one you want to like kind of compare where it was and, and where it was now. How many days do you remember that the first show in Los Angeles? How many days long was it? I don't remember any more than Friday, Saturday, Sunday, but you know, maybe there was some Thursday stuff. And then later on, as, as you moved along, they did some more things. Cause they had to have some time to work in the, the, the softball game or some of the seminars. So it kind of expanded 
uh, to now it's sort of Tuesday or Wednesday through Sunday, ma- mainly Wednesday to Sunday for the for the 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 uh, paying customers. Uh, yeah, dealers setting up on Tuesday, but um, so it's expanded and 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 that's a good thing. But you, you just got to dedicate your week to it if you're a dealer. How well received was was that one right off the bat, Los Angeles? Were people a little trepidation no, there, it, it, or it was very well everyone... received? The the, the founders, uh, you know, Gavin Riley, Steve Bruner, and Mike Burkus were very well respected as as serious collectors, as dealers, and as promoters, because they were already putting yeah. on uh, very successful shows in the LA area. And so they already had a track record. They, they were, they, people liked them, they respected them and they trusted them. And other than that, you know, John, it might not happen. And I, I've said on another podcast, I'm on my own, I guess, too, that, that Gavin Riley was the unsung hero and he's still around, but he was, a very he was a school teacher, very serious collector, had a fabulous collection, um, and then Mike Burkus is is just was kind of the megaphone. You know, he was the master promoter, and and Steve Bruner was kind of you know you know a force in his own right, but not as not as out there as the other two guys. And those you know obviously those that know the national now it has a, a heavy corporate uh, presence, which I actually. Uh, like I think it's an, important. Uh, how about the early ones? Were, were they less corporate? Yeah, Obviously, I, there's less companies, I believe, then than we 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 could we... talk to the to, to the companies, you know. And I, I was not part of any of the leadership, uh, but but you know, I was in the hobby, and I was a person that had some some weight, I guess. And if you talk to the nat to the uh, to the card companies about, hey, you know, you really ought to set up the national. They go, why? Everybody at the national. <laughs> Already knows who we are. Why? Yeah. You know, why? Why would we? Need, we don't need brand awareness. We're tops, or we're yeah. or we're Donruss, or we're Fleer. Uh, but then what happened, John? Is when one of them does it, then the other ones yeah. say, well, "Wait a minute, they're they We don't want them to get an edge on us." So it started yeah. creeping in. And again, I I really thank Mike Burkus for that. Mike Burkus uh, had worked for Classic at one time, and it did had had done some consulting for some of the card companies, and he. He was a, a master negotiator. And so he tried to figure out a way to get him in because he knew once he got him in, they they would want to be there and they'd see the value. And so, and again, by Anaheim and in 91, they, they were kind of there to stay. Yep. So you needed that one shoe to drop to get. I think so. Yeah. Do you remember who that was? Who was the first one to cross that line and say, all right. We're I'd have to look back in the programs and the and the yeah. schematics, but it's it, tops. You know, they were the first one in for doing cards, but they're not an early adopter back in those days. They they weren't. So the the underdogs, the 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 Donners and the Fleer. I mean, Upper Deck immediately got in. Upper Deck was was at the national in '88. They didn't even. They barely had a company. They they were they had a presence, a strong yeah. presence in '88, which was the the original Atlantic City show and they were and and you know they were passing out these promos and people said wait a minute this is going to be a dollar a pack I don't know if that's going to fly but they've <laughs> always seen the value of an upscale product and and taking the marketing seriously and 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 they've had a great success because of that what was the first year like you and the company back at uh you know attended as as a corporation do you remember? Well, I mean, I, I will say this: eighty in eighty, I probably was there. I, I know I shared a table with Gervis Ford, who was my partner in the in first base. Yes. And so at that point, probably right around that time, I took my show inventory. Uh, I had my collection, and I set that aside, and I had some, you know, better dupes, you know, that at my trade material that was more serious stuff. My, for example, my Jackie Robinson. 48 leaf. Uh, I did not put that in the store stock. Otherwise it would be gone, yeah. long gone now. But, uh, but the basic inventory that I took to shows in the seventies, I merged that in with Gervis's stuff and, and, and he already had a store going and we calculated the value and I put in basically f- enough to be a 50% partner. And so, and, and basically that's when my collecting pretty much stopped. I already had a lot of the yeah. sets. I just set them aside and I was no longer a dealer at that point, but I still had interest in the store. And so I think that first table that Gervis and I had, 
he mainly was behind the table and he, he wasn't there very much. We just, I mean, it was kind of a side gig for both of us. We both had good jobs. And so, yeah. you know, he, you know, we, we were out walking around. I mean, that's the perspective. You're saying with no one at the table, like no, no one, one watched. At the table. No one at the that's table. A, and there was some nice wow. stuff there. That's, we just throw a sheet over it and tell, tell the neighboring dealer, hey, we're going to be back yeah. in a couple hours. I mean, you're yeah, not, that's, no, we're just going to go browse. And so, uh, but that was the turning point for me to be moving toward type collecting instead of buying collections and buy, sell, trade and, and, and being an, like a dealer. When the, when the price guides came out, I, I really was trying to improve the price guides, which meant, you know, buying type yeah. cards and, and not big collections and things like that. So I was every national now I've had, even though we've had corporate booths, I've had that, um, it's always been a case where I've been more time, way more time on the other side of the table, on not behind the table, but out, out in front wandering around. And like, yeah. Rich does. you know, Rich was our guy that did that, but I, I, I want to do what Rich was doing. I didn't want to s- s- sit behind the table or the booth or, you know, behind the, behind the wall. So in, in setting up as a dealer, something I've done since 1987 myself. How were those national shows as far as selling? Were they were they productive? Were you happy with how you did? Well, again, it was a vintage. It was a vintage crowd. I mean, because yeah. the, you weren't, especially in the 80s. I mean, that, that yeah. you're you're approaching not necessarily junk wax, but it was too easy to get the the, the basic sets. And so it was mainly. I mean, there were a few people that did that, but mostly it was vintage. It was, uh, you know, pre-war. It was regional cards, hot dog cards, you know, things like that. And so uh, these were veteran. They were collectors slash dealers uh, those first few years. Uh, they were they were dealers that set up with their duplicates in order to trade or sell in order to get cards they needed. And so that that's what was fun. And so there were, there were always interesting stuff there. And so I like I said I I've been very blessed to be on the side of the, of the national tables to be able to wander around and see, you know, like being a kid in a candy store, being in the museum and being able to see all that stuff instead of being stuck behind a table. Whenever I'd get behind the table, they, people just ask me questions and they'd ask me the same questions over and over again. I thought, you know, I need to, I need to get a, I need to get on the other side and go and go seek out what, what, um, what I want. So I've done that for 40 something years now. And like I said, the only guilt I feel is that it's so much fun. Yeah. Do you remember the first, uh, the first national at Beckett media with, with the price guides uh, uh, attended? Well, uh, let me put it this way. I mean, we, we were, I mean, the, the price guide was a big deal in 80, but that was the, the, yeah. the, the annual. The big, and yeah, so the they, they, there wasn't any monthly until 84 and the 84, it was it we started late in 84 in fact the the final formation decisions were made really at the Parsippany 84 national and so i kind of had some strategies of how i might do it and i you know so i talked to some people and at the end of that show i i knew what i was going to do and i knew how i was going to go about it and so i i had some you know, I, I many thoughts, but it, it crystallized at that national. And then it was started. The first issue was in November of of 84. And so then by 85, um, yeah, we're there and we're selling, you know, selling uh, again. We've all, even though we sold subscriptions, so much of it was selling through dealers that, uh, you know, we'd sold back issues. And pretty much in the in the mid late 80s, we'd have a, you know, kind of a some kind of a presence. It, it wasn't like a corporate booth because I don't think corporate booths really existed. You either had a table mm-hmm. or you didn't, you know, but then by 91, we had somehow we made a trade with Berkus who loved trading cards or anything. He would, he would negotiate anything. And so we said, we'll give you some publicity in the magazines and then you'll give us, uh, we'll get a corporate booth. And again, we'll give yeah. you some free ads in the magazines, all stuff. But what we did is you weren't allowed to sell stuff in the corporate area. And so we kept our dealer booths and yeah. rich Klein has told the story and we were able to merge it in with Rich's table priority. And so we had some, some really good location, you know, near the front where we were able to sell stuff. And mainly that was back issues 
of mainly at that point was baseball. But by 91, yeah, there, there were the other sports were, were kicking in too. But we did a great business in an older, you know, superstar cover, uh, early baseball monthly magazines. Obviously, Beckett Media became uber successful. How much credit do you attribute to the national presence in, in the, you know, the emerging uh, of your company? Uh, well, I mean, like I said about Tops, is that people would say you need to be there for brand awareness. I'm saying we we already have the brand awareness. We so we we needed to have some objectives for being there, other than saying, "Hey, we're here. We're nice guys." Uh, we were all we, we at every big show. We had our price analysts there anyway, so we already were doing that, and that was it. So, but what turned what the difference was for us in the '80s and the and the early '90s. We kind of paid our way by doing, you know, back issues, and we signed up people and we sold books and things like that to encourage subscriptions. But, you know, we we paid our way by publications, print, and then in the by ninety nine though, <laughs> with grading coming on, that was a whole nother story. And so then yeah. we clearly had to have a corporate presence, uh, not a secretive booth, but we had to have the draping and. And, and the private room for the graders, and that's just taken off like gangbusters. Yeah, no doubt uh, that, like you said, you, you I know you mentioned the 91 a couple of times is kind of where it, it really changed it, into it. something else. Um, the early ones, obviously, there's hundreds of signers uh, at the at the current uh, uh, formation uh, of the National. Were there autograph guests even in the early days, or was that something sort of added on uh, later on? It, it increased as it went. I mean, it wasn't. It, it didn't start out like it was. I mean, it. It. You know, again, to give another. He's not an unsung hero because he's he's well established. But Jeff Rosenberg really yeah. had a vision for, and so it's been outsourced to him for a long time to really make it work because you can't make it work by just athletes showing up and signing for the people that are in the line. It, you, you have to have a year round autograph business because a lot of the signers come in and they sign for the people in the line, but then they sign some other stuff for later sale to make it yeah. worth it for everybody. And so those first ones that to have a star there, yeah, there were some stars there sometimes, but, but that wasn't the draw. Again, this was, this was, you know, it was, it was, I think it was 80% cards and, and probably 80% of the cards were vintage, you know, so not as much autograph, some autograph stuff, some memorabilia stuff, but uh, a lot of it was cards. A lot of it was cards. And so the autograph, you know, was a draw, but it, an autograph, uh, you know, a guest signer, but people were already going to come like now people would already come anyway, because yeah. sometimes the dealers are the stars and the card companies are the stars. Yeah. Or I like to I like to think the cards themselves too. And the cards. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, you mentioned uh the grading, uh 99, the, the you know, you, you mentioned specifically. Um, you know, just talk about uh, you know that the, the adding the grading aspect to you know the repertoire and, and the national effect uh with it. Obviously, you didn't like you said, you didn't need necessarily need the national to to launch that but uh, i'm sure it didn't it didn't hurt how how was it received well, no, no john it would, have, it would have hurt if we weren't there yeah because at yeah. that point psa was had a huge lead on us and so we 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 need to be there to say hey we are we are we we think we're a better alternative but you know we, we are an alternative and they were in first place and, and, and still are in terms of volume for sure and so, but it, it doubled our, it, it more than doubled the cost of us showing up at the national. It yeah. more than doubled our footprint of being there. It, it more than doubled the complexity and the number of people we had to take and all that stuff. So, um, uh, and it, it was the right thing to do, but like I said, if we wouldn't have gone, it would have been a negative. And people say, why aren't they coming? Because, you know, you, you kind of need to subject yourself, not necessarily to abuse, but to hear from the customer and there's always going to be some customers who want to tell you how to run their business and ignoring them is the worst thing you can do. And so listening to them and say, well, we're going to, we're, we'll, uh, we'll look into it. 
Yeah, like you mentioned, PSA at that point had had sort of the the stranglehold on it. How competitive was that entering that arena? Did it, you know, were there open lines of communication or or not really? Like, hey, we're we're competing for the same, you know, same piece of the pie. Was it? I don't want to say animosity, but no, was no, it? No, I, I don't think. There... It was. I mean, I've had Joe Orlando on, and he was, you know, a, a very worthy competitor and an outstanding guy, but. You know, that we tried not to compete. We tried to be different. Yeah. And so PSA it really. But then that's up with the subgrades came. Well, we had subgrades. We had inner sleeve. We had a, a, yeah. a, a, a you know, more, a, a heavier, stronger holder. Uh, but also we marketed more aggressively to the average collector and, and not so much yeah. to the dealers. They really had. And we went more toward modern than than vintage and so they they always had a very strong vintage and very strong relationships i mean the dealers were the original bulk submitters and we didn't really yeah. make plans we, we thought well we, we don't want to make it a special elite kind of thing that you've got to know somebody to get you know that we just had and we didn't charge extra for expensive cards so we had a lot yeah. of di differentiators and so if you want to we didn't make it you didn't jump join a club or anything you just you send us some cards and we'll, and again, in those days we had on time or it's free. Yeah. So we had yeah, a guarantee. Even then PSA yep. had trouble because they had so much volume. And so that really helped us get on the, I, on the I, I remember that. Cause there was, I would, I'd be like, man, I hope it's late by a day. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> So yeah, I mean, it's funny you met like you forget that and then you hear that and you're like, yeah, I remember that. Well, it wasn't funny when I was the boss. <laughs> Cut out of my pocket, John. <laughs> and I never listen. I subbed. I never. It never happened. So kudos uh, to Beckett uh, back then because uh, I was crossing my. I just wanted it a day late where I didn't have to uh, to, to pay it for. But uh, you know, you mentioned the '91. Everyone that that knows about or has been there points to that as the the largest attended, uh, you know, it's, it's, I know the recent one uh, was debated that that beat it, but it, you know, the national said the 91 still uh, kind of is the one to be, what was it? I mean, with your knowledge of the hobby, what was it about the 91 national that made that just explode that particular year? If in your opinion, well, I mean, there, there, there were so many corporate giveaways. I mean, Brian Gray, you should have him on because he was, you know, you got to subtract. Uh, if you think Brian Gray is energetic and enterprising now, turn back the clock 30 plus years. And he was he was a young, very aggressive, very, um, very uh, resourceful young man who was working yeah. the show from every end, including outside and inside the show. Uh, because there were so many corporate giveaways and he's, he's very bright to know, to arbitrage these things, you know, to figure out, yeah. Hey, I can pick it up for free here. I can sell it to somebody in line who didn't want to stand in line for 10 bucks. Then I'll go back and get some more. And then he'd have people getting it for him and runners and things like that. So he, he, he mopped up and he wasn't the only one. So there was yeah. a very dynamic element of excitement, even though this is pre the digital world. So you, you couldn't yeah. look on your, on your device. Um, so you just had to be in the know and, and what was happening at one end of the, of the, of the room or where the corporates were uh, you know, you, you could pick up free stuff from the corporates and then go sell it in the other corner of the room where they say, Hey, I've never seen this before. I'd say, well, they're five bucks. <laughs> so it was the birth of the flipper. It was, almost it was, if it wasn't birth, then it sure took off then. And I yeah. said Brian was was a, a a great example of that. Back in those early ones, you know, not maybe not necessarily the first one, but even even the early ones, were were people traveling in from you know far destinations to to yeah. attend these? Yeah, even overseas. I mean, they they still. Yeah. Come. I mean, it was the place. It was the best show you could go to in the year. Those first ten years, but again, they were made. They weren't. I don't think they were investors they were serious collectors and i don't know that they were trying to buy up all the cheap cards as much as they were trying to fill in you know stuff they needed you know but, yeah. but these are those early 80s it's before michael jordan i mean like yeah. star company basketball you could have bought you know in the in yeah. the mid 80s you could have bought that right from the from the from the horse's mouth so were there any 
It, were there any shows like it was it, obviously it was called the national were there any shows that tried to sort of steal the thunder or compete uh, you know what i mean uh we have shows now they're not necessarily competing with the national but they're trying to make a, a name in their own right was there anything even back then i mean here in the you know we have the in white plains we had the east coast national um which is not obviously as big but uh you know a, a great show on its own right, was there any attempts to sort of, you know, the you know take that that belt, if you will, you know, to to use? Kind well, of I, I think uh, again, I attribute this more to Gavin than 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 Mike. Although Mike, I, I, I'm sure saw the wisdom of this, but what 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 they did, which was really brilliant, is that they didn't say, "Hey, we three guys who have started this national concept, we own it." And so it's going to be out here. It's going to stay in L.A., which was is a fabulous hobby area. And, it, you know, it's a great, yeah. great area. We're just going to keep it here. We're going to be in charge. We're going to own it. What they did was by allowing it to move around the country, they were able to placate the other uh, well-known dealer, collector, promoter types that had these strong regional shows. And so I think there was a feeling like the Detroit group, it was the key uh, promoter in Detroit that said, well, wait a minute. I, I mean, I can, I can have it next year and it's my deal. And then, yeah. and then it went to St. Louis and then it went to Chicago. And so they basically were enlisting their quote unquote competition to say, you're going to get a turn. Yeah. And so in those early years, the, the key promoters, I think kind of waited their, their, their turn. And what happened was, is that, once you had a national, once you'd been a national promoter, that was a feather in your cap. Plus it boosted, it doubled or tripled your mailing list. And so yeah. you had a lot of residual value from that. And so to compete against the national, it didn't make sense because people, and it just didn't seem right. A lot of the same dealers know each other, talk. There, there was a sense of fair play, I think. Yeah. In rotation. Well, was that the original concept, Dr. Jim, do you know, or did they sort of adapt on the fly and said, this is probably the way to go to. I think, I, like I said, I think that's, that's what Gavin had in mind all along. He was hoping that somebody, you know, I had some conversations with him and he's still, he's still around. He's kind of in the background now, but he, he, uh, I think he really had a hope that people, that, that some other promoters would, would take the ball and run with it and, and not, that, that it wouldn't be a cookie cutter national, but that they'd have some principles of how to do it and, and how to be successful on a more national level. But he was really hoping for, for to really be a national show. It needed to not be just in LA every time or even Chicago. Yeah. So it wasn't until to, in, in Chicago until like 83, which now we see that Chicago is a very natural uh, yeah. hub uh, and very successful. It's the, it's probably the most successful site for the national on average yeah every, so every you, chicago's been good yeah i've been there twice i i have no real complaints so other than uh what the cost to fly there which at the time looks like a deal compared to today's yeah. uh today's prices so uh, like i said uh, uh and i've said you know uh, other occasions you've attended every one what's the What's the closest he ever came to to not attending or missing one? Was there ever one that you almost didn't get to go to for whatever reason? Well, I mean, I I, I did drop dead of a heart attack in late '96, and I and so there was some jeopardy of whether I would be going anywhere. Uh, yeah. But and so I I kind of eased back into you know so I, I really took a step back in the company, but I still. When uh, I think I even went to the Hawaii show in the spring that year. So I was doing better, but I was, you know, I had a big shock to my system. And so just like that, the first national was an inflection point. Uh, the 91 was an inflection point. And then 96 and 97 with my heart attack. Yeah. And I kind of, that really made me a lot more of an executive as opposed to a day to day, you know, doing all the price guide stuff because I just, I'd been pushing myself too hard. And so that was weird going to the national in 97 and trying to figure out, you know, what's my new posture. You know, uh, you know, people are going to, they're wondering if I'm, if I'm going to be in a wheelchair or something, you know, it's just, yeah. and then in 05, same thing. I'd sold the company in January of 05 
And so to go in in uh, late July of 05 and go with the, the my successor uh, CEO from the new group that had bought the company, uh, the, a guy that I liked, but I, I could introduce him to people. And so I was kind of sort of retired, but kind of semi-retired, like I say now. So I just was enjoying and introducing him to people. And, but I didn't, you know, John, I didn't have to do stuff. I, yeah. I could do stuff I wanted to. And that's, that's yeah, what well, I, you enjoyed it. You, I, didn't, and I enjoyed you. it more. And so it's been a different kind of enjoyment. And then in the last 10 years or so, I've been a little more aggressive about the dollar boxes and things like that. And just touching yeah. the cards, touching yeah. the cards. Is there anything from those early nationals that we no longer have that you'd actually, whether it was an event, you mentioned like a softball game, is there not necessarily that, but I'm just using that example. Is there anything you'd like to see sort of, uh, you know, reinvigorated or brought back, uh, you know, uh, into today's modern uh, you know, national that you, you think would, would still trans, you know, transition well and still be good that, that they don't have any longer anything. Well, if you look at those early nationals, they had pool parties and, and, uh, and softball games and things like that. And some of that, uh, those first nationals and especially the second one, which doesn't get a lot of talk, but it was, it was the, the promoter, you know, the name on it is Lloyd Torpy out of Flint, Michigan, who had done these big Detroit shows. But really, it was his wife, <laughs> Carol, who was yeah. not a card collector, uh, and certainly not a sports card collector. But, you know, she, you know, kind of ran a tight ship and she so they were in it together. And so I think that second national is she said we should have a pool party because wives should come and stuff like that. But, John, I don't think that's stuck. I don't think that's stuck because then you look at, oh, of course, then in 83, you had Bruce Painter, who is passed away now, but was an outstanding guy. But he had Benita, his wife, with him. And so I think there was some attempt to make it kinder and gentler for 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 women. But over the years, I mean, people just wanted to be at their tables and and maximize their money. So the so the the, the softball game, I, I can't remember when the last softball game was, maybe 85 or 86. Uh, see, I, I'd vote to bring that start. back because I I still play. I'm so like, but, <laughs> but you're gonna you're you're not gonna have anybody to play. You're just gonna, you're gonna be, there'll be no outfielders. So you just, <laughs> just circle the bases. Yeah, um, and you. there were some good players. There there were some good players. Yeah. They, they were competitive games, but it was. I think my 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 sense is it was more choose up sides, yeah. which is weird because you didn't know who the who the, um, you know, who, who the good players were necessarily after until you'd seen them play. Uh, but that it just it just went by the wayside. And I don't think it's going to come back. Uh, what will come back, I think, are the seminars. I think the Mint Collective has proven that um, there, there probably is a mark, just like we're doing, of, of content creation. Some content yeah. creation when you have a bunch of people there at a venue and you can you can digitize it and and do live streaming, but also release it later. Uh, I th I think that's that's here to stay. That's here to stay. But mostly yeah. it's a card show and a you know and you and you get the corporate goodies and you do the you you observe the breaks firsthand because you can be right there and you get in line for you know to get a signature from your favorite player or whatever. So so those elements are. Again, the, it, people are voting with their dollars, John. I mean, they, they, yeah. they're going to. Yeah, for sure. It's, what do they spend? You know, what does it say that they sold out of VIP or super VIP? Well, one of them they sold out. Yeah. I mean, how could they sell out at these very expensive? Well, because they've got only so many goodie bags, I guess. Yeah. But you think get some more goodie bags. If you get $200 up front or 250 or whatever it is for an, a five day, you know, all access pass. Why don't you want to get that money as much as you can as soon as you can? Yeah. Yeah. Well, those are good problems, I guess, to, to have rather than the other side of that coin. Speaking of other side of the coin, I asked you something you like to see brought back. Is it, you know, uh, is there something in, in the current uh, rendition of the national that you're either not fond of or you think could be better? Like, uh, you know what I mean? Uh, if, if I'll put you on the spot a little bit. Or, or not really. 
Well, the the improvement that I think would be good, and I don't know that there there maybe just not an, enough incentive for that. But you, they have a captive audience of you know six or eight hundred dealers or booths or whatever. I mean, it depends on how you count. But each one of those has a certain kind of uh, presence. They have uh, some percentage of vintage or memorabilia or whatever. And I'd love to see something where where you could uh, kind of. Uh, not necessarily Google Maps or, or but you, you could kind of and people do this. They'll wander around with a GoPro or something and show what's there. But if you could database what's at the national so that you could walk in and know, you know, this dealer has this kind of stuff and that's table yeah. 873. And so I want to make sure I go there, um, you know, but it, so it's very it, it becomes too flea market ish that you walk in and you're overwhelmed and you, yeah. there's, as Rich always says, there's a lot more vintage toward the front. Um, but still to know where the obscure, there's some people that have really cool, obscure stuff. If you're into penance. There's one yeah. guy that has penance and you could, you could miss it. Yeah. And so I, so I, almost I, some more yeah. interactive, like uh, interactive almost, directory of some kind. Yeah. Yeah. Where you can almost type in sort of what and again, some is. of the, some of the yeah. YouTubers and, and, you know, the video, guys are going around and shooting some of that stuff, but really to make it, uh, I, I think that'd be cool. That'd be cool. Cause otherwise yeah, it's yeah, that's, too overwhelming. Yeah. That's, that's a great answer. I, again, you've been to everyone. I, I know you enjoy uh, each and every one for, for their, all their own reasons. Is there one that's a particular favorite to you or one that stands out over the others? Is it the 91 or is it, or is it something another year? Well, 91 was a blur. Cause I, you know, all this stuff was going on and I, I was having a bunch of meetings and we were just, it, it, we, we were going so strong. So that, that kind of wasn't fun. It's not fun to go over the speed limits. <laughs> yeah, <for> yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm enjoying now as much as any of them. And uh, you know, I'm just trying to figure out how to, whether I need to pace myself and, you know, to kind of portion out cause I've got some, podcast stuff and I'm, it's some people I just genuinely want to see. And then I got yeah. I want to move through some cards. I mean, I, I th there's stuff there that I wouldn't otherwise get to see. And, um, you know, so it's, 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 I've got to divvy up my time and, and then there's the evenings and, and other things that are, that are fun as well. So it's, I want, I begin, I, I want to make it like a vacation, not a, a five days of work. That's why I feel yeah. guilty <laughs> because yeah. it is fun. Yeah, no doubt. If you're not having fun at the national, like I say on my show, well, you, you're, you're, you're doing trouble. something wrong. You're doing something wrong, or you're Except or you're working well, too hard. If you're uh, if you're there for you, 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 yeah, people get if you have walk in with a want list and you don't pull the trigger on Wednesday night of a card that you see, and you're hoping to go back Sunday night to get it for a cheaper price, you you could get pretty frustrated at yourself. Yeah. No doubt. And uh, well, I listen, I look forward to seeing you there here in about uh, 10 days from when, when this airs and uh, uh, we'll be uh, live, uh, for, you know, a little shameless plug uh, as part of Hobby Hotline. We'll be on uh, the stage. We're scheduled at this point Friday at 10 a.m. Eastern and uh, look forward to definitely uh, sharing the stage uh, with you once again, like we got to do last year and, and, uh, enjoying the the national and uh i appreciate you sharing some of those those insights from from the past ones that someone like me and and most frankly most hobbyists uh, wouldn't know about uh without you know you, you you know sharing that uh those experiences and how those early ones uh were i i thank you can I give you two questions? Because you sure. really, you're, you're the guy with the countdown clock for the for the national, but yeah, I, I suppose I could ask Ray or, or or John Brogy or somebody. But two questions I have about this year's national. Uh, one is, will the U.S. Postal Service be there? You like set up? Yeah, or on the side to take overflow to mail back stuff because they are at some shows. Yeah. Uh, well, I will say this. <laughs> they just raised their rates. So they might want to like uh, uh, opportunistic, you know, to, to get the uh, six, five, six point five percent. A one ounce stamp is now uh, 60 cents. So, uh, and like you said, it's a captive audience, right? Or I mean, it's not well, a you don't have to mail it, but like I said, if I if I pick up more than I can fit in my carry-on, then I've got a problem. And 
Yeah. See, I have a luxury this year driving. This is exactly. the first one exactly. I'm ever gonna ever gonna drive to. So and uh, and last question is yeah. I've not been able to find anywhere what the dates are for the 2023 national. When do they usually announce that? Well, I don't know, but I mean, you'd think they would already have announced it. I go on the website. I, I just see that it's going to be in Chicago, but they don't say when. I'm assuming it's the last kind of week in July. Yeah, it's always it's everyone not, I've went. It's I, it's it's I've I've not been able to find it anywhere. Yeah, why do you? I mean, I, I guess I'm. I'll, I'll answer your question with a question, like a tennis match. I mean, why do you do you think there's there's a reason maybe for that? Is there maybe some issues arising or? Well, maybe they don't want people thinking ahead, you know, to, yeah. they want them to just go to Atlantic city and get that one, you know, done and, and, and have a great show there and not be thinking, well, I'll just go to Chicago the next year. Well, they're not even putting when Chicago is going to be. Uh, almost but, like a sports team. Like, don't worry about the next game. Well, uh, uh, yeah, but also your, your family vacation. If you wanted to take a family vacation next summer, not this summer, but next summer, it'd be nice to know exactly when the national was. That's that's my point. Yeah. So, well, I think I I think you if you really wanted, you could probably guess which. Uh, is, is, I'm you know, guessing an day. educated guess, having been to all of them, John. But yeah. it's, I'd like to make it <laughs> yeah. better than the guess. Yeah. No, I agree with you, but that's why I asked you. I wonder if there's a strategic reason, and yeah. and and your answer does there is. sort of make strategic sense. So that yeah. that's for sure. Well, it's going to well, get. Great. Look forward to yeah, seeing. Yeah, no doubt. Thank you for for giving some time and and sharing some of those memories of, of those early uh, days of the national. Not many people. I, I truthfully, I don't know anyone else I could have asked. Uh, to do it. So I'm very grateful and uh, uh, check out Dr. Jim's uh, awesome daily show, uh, Sports Card Insights. And uh, uh, he touches on that and, and so much else. So uh, uh, don't miss that every day. I'm sure we're both still having a really good time. So that's good. Yeah, no doubt.